Hello, and welcome back to Loop TV, and thanks for joining us for another edition of The Loop Show. Don't turn off, yes. It really is just me in the studio. I'm afraid my compadre, Dave Rawlings, has been poached by ITV to sit next to Christine Bleakley. Oh, I'm only kidding. He has, however, put a secret squirrel hat on and is currently in destinations unknown for a special report that's going to come up later in the show, so stay tuned for that. First, of course, though, let's look at some news this morning. First up, it's congratulations time from us all and probably every pilot around the world to Steve Newjay. He, of course, flew his home-built Vans RV7 from South End all the way down to Cape Town and all the way back to South End in a little over 83 hours. He did, of course, break the legendary Alex Henshaw time for the Cape Run. Coincidentally, a little later this month, Taff Smith is going to try and break the record again in his home-built glasses. So, of course, best of luck to Taff. Now, moving on, we have a bit of a clarion call to send out. As some of you will know, the last surviving Vulcan in the world, XH558, appeared earlier last month at the Coventry Health for Heroes event, a really successful show. However, it might be the last public display of the Vulcan ever. Now, this aircraft needs a little bit of money to carry on flying through the end of this year, and more particularly for next year. And there's one way that you can help. It's really simple. Go to vulcantothesky.org. Now, we were privileged enough to fly with the Vulcan for a photo shoot as it made its flight up to Coventry. And it's not our place to get in our soapbox, but it really would be a shame if it wasn't there any longer. So that website address is vulcantothesky.org. It's got everything you need to know. Now, very sad news. I'm afraid to say that Renault Akal, the world's best aerobatic pilot, has been killed. He was just on a pleasure flight in France with his family in his privately owned Joe Dell. We met Renault last year at the Silverstone World Aerobatic Championships and he was a really, really lovely guy. He couldn't have been more accommodating. It's a terrible loss to the world of aviation and aerobatics and all our sympathies go to his family and friends. Now, as I said, you're having to make do with me this month. There's a reason for that, of course. So, you know, guys, as P1 magazine, we tested the Global 5000 jet. Bombardier, of course, said, why don't you come over and find out how we put our jets together? And when it came to drawing straws, I had the buttery fingers that day. DC and Dave Rawlings are, I think, just about landing in Montreal. We're here in Montreal, home of Bombardier, a huge company that makes planes, trains... And they used to make snowmobiles. We want to find out everything there is to know about private jets, and Bombardier are the people to ask. They don't just make one aircraft. No, they make the Learjet, Challenger and Global series. We're going to find out how they're made, visit their flight test centre and find out what they're like to fly. But first, we're going to see the whole range. Bombardier is a Canadian company with its roots in making snowmobiles. The company founder, Joseph Armand Bombardier, built his first commercially successful snowmobile back in 1937, a business which um, snowboarded into making trains in the 1970s. Aviation came along in 1986 when Bombardier bought Canada Air, which made the Challenger wide-body jet and also amphibious firefighting aircraft. In 1990, Bombardier expanded further with the acquisition of Learjet and two years later, de Havilland. Since the year 2000, Bombardier has launched a global range of business jets, that's the 5000 and XRS, the charter fleet favourite Challenger 605 and the Challenger 800, and the latest version of the Learjet, the 60XR. It has aircraft fitting almost every category, from the smallest Learjet 40 up to the intercontinental, ultra-luxurious Global XRS for captains of industry and heads of state. And it's still filling in the gaps, with the Learjet 85, a step between a 60 and a Challenger range, and at the top end, a new global jet is being talked about. With a jet to suit everyone's needs, what about us, the Loop TV team? We travel lots across Europe, often to a deadline, carrying camera and video kit and people, and we like going fast. So we've decided the Learjet 60XR is the perfect aircraft for us. But before we place our order, we're off to the Learjet factory in Wichita, Kansas to see how it's built. Well, this is it. This is where a jet comes together. As you can tell, it's really loud, so I need earplugs. I also need safety goggles. But this is where the Learjet 60 is born. So Stan, can you tell us what happens here? Yeah, currently right now we're in the fabrication division of the plant. Uh, that's where all of the raw stock, actually the raw material, comes to shape. Uh, it goes across our routers, our forming jigs, our heat treating, and so on. These structures that we're seeing is actually part of what enables our 60 model to fly at 51,000 feet, unlike most all other business jets. 
everything is mostly CNC operated, so uh, computers. And, and uh, every day we get our day's worth of material, we make our day's worth of parts, so it's very easy to keep track of what we have and what we don't have. Okay, currently now we're here in the wing shop where we uh, assemble the 60 model wing. As you can see here, we have the upper wing skins. Right now we're in the process of riveting all of the skins together, where in which we will actually install the skin all in one complete piece. From wing tip to wing tip, it's mainly held on with your high locks and rivets. Uh, we do install it with wet sealer due to it is the fuel tank of a Learjet 60. And then we put the upper skin, which we refer to as the lid. Uh, which everything goes on and then when it comes down it's ready to have the landing gear and, and all the external portions put onto the wing. We also build the whole main fuselages. The details that we've seen fabbed in the fab shop, they actually all come together. We build small sub-assemblies throughout the shop and it comes to the main mating jig where everything starts to come together. As you can see on one side of the line we actually assemble the forward fuselage piece of it and coming up from the rear here is where we assemble the aft fuselage and it comes to this position right here is actually where the forward and the aft is mated together. Here now we're entering the empennage area. Uh, this is mainly where we make the vertical to the horizontal stabilizer. Uh, it is a very precise piece of the aircraft. It is part of our flight controls. Uh, the pin, the actual hinge pin that we actually put in, we have to freeze to a minus 30 degrees, uh, then insert into it due to the close collar cold. Now here you can see we're almost complete. We have our, our tail already assembled and we're now installing our wire harnesses that we've received from the wire shop. Uh, the systems are being completed up in the front. Uh, here in just a few days, we will it will deliver the final assembly. We will exit right out that door. Okay, so once it leaves here, it's off to final assembly. Correct. It's where the wing will actually be mated, and then their systems checks and so on will start happening. Okay. Well, I better get over there, Stan. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Yep. In final assembly, all the remaining external components are added to the aircraft, and full functional testing is undertaken. First, the wing is mated to the fuselage and secured by just eight bolts. Next, the plumbing is installed and even more wire harnesses. Looks a lot like the wires behind my TV, but soon it will be turned into a state-of-the-art avionics system. Now the aircraft is missing just one, no, make that two components, the engines. They arrive from Pratt & Whitney into the engine shop where the cowlings and other accessories are added. An engineer then has to work out which out of the two engines has more power. No two are ever exactly the same. The hotter engine is then put on the left-hand side and the less powerful slave engine on the right. After the engine hang and further testing, the aircraft is ready to take flight for the first time, after which it's handed across to completions. Once the aircraft is flown out, we've flown the aircraft and it's functioning properly. Uh, we've painted the aircraft to the customer specification. Uh, the aircraft comes over to completion where we, uh, we add any additional mods. If there's any customer options that are specific to that customer, we install those here. And then we install the customer's furniture, their seats, the carpet. We complete the cockpit, we finish the cockpit out, and make the aircraft more personal for the customer. Once we're done with the aircraft, and uh, we'll shake the aircraft, make sure that uh, it's in top condition. Uh, the aircraft then will go to completion flight, where they'll fly it again to make sure everything's functioning properly, and then we deliver it to the customer. And it's here at the impressive delivery center where the brand new Learjet is handed over to the customer. The last phase is the aircraft delivery. When the aircraft is ready, we'll send notification for the customer to come in and accept it. We perform an acceptance flight. That's really a crucial element to demonstrate that we've fulfilled our obligation relative to the contract. It's really kind of a time of celebration too. We host the customers properly. There's an entry into service component to make sure that when the aircraft goes into service um, that our customers know who to call if they have any kind of issues. Then the last component really is there's a financial element to it. The balance that they owe us is paid and then they are free to take the aircraft wherever they see fit in the world. So they turn up with a bag full of cash and then take a Learjet home? Pretty much. Well, I believe the money's in the bank, Chris, so thanks very much. You're I'll welcome, be off. Dave. All right. My new Learjet. Well, we'll leave Dave to his Learjet. 
Meanwhile, we are at Bombardier's Flight Test Centre here at Wichita, where they test a full range of Bombardier aircraft, Learjet, Challenger, Global and the CRJ airliner. Let's have a peek at what they do. Bombardier's Flight Test Centre at Wichita does all the flight testing on all of their aircraft, from the flight test of an aircraft off the assembly line, through to proving new bits of kit, such as a new Global Vision flight deck, or undertaking type certificate testing on a brand new prototype aircraft. On our visit, that's just what the test team was doing with the new CRJ regional jet. We asked the flight crew about the process. Uh, generally, most things you see in here, if there's orange on them, you won't find them in the uh, basic aircraft. Just generally a test equipment for specific test purposes. This panel down here controls the engine. That way we can change the engine thrust to the thrust we need for the exact conditions rather than having to find the right temperature, altitude and time to get those uh, conditions. In the center here, we've got our uh, attitude recovery system. If we're doing a uh, slow speed testing or uh, departure type testing, if the aircraft itself shouldn't recover in the tail of the aircraft, we have a parachute. When you realize the aircraft's unrecoverable, if you were to deploy the chute, aircraft nose will drop down, straight down, and then uh, at that point, uh, the aircraft's flyable, release the chute, and then we'll be able to fly away. So. Uh, initially, you'll start with your performance testing, take the airplane to the edge of the envelope, make sure there's nothing unusual with handling qualities, and then conversely, you'll go to the opposite end of the aircraft, you know, take it as slow as it'll go. All the uh, avionics in between, make sure to let uh, the FMS itself, which is guiding the airplane from point A to B, is uh, performing everything as, as it's intended. Well, right now, we're doing a lot of the failure modes of the aircraft, so if uh, one set of the flight controls were to fail or if the hydraulics were to fail, does this aircraft still fly safely? And of course, everything's being followed by a team on the ground as well, isn't it? For higher risk testing, we'll always use telemetry, so personnel on the ground can be watching. They've got the uh, cockpit uh, voice, so they can hear everything that we're saying and talking. And on top of that, they uh, have uh, a series of script charts with which they can see almost every parameter on the airplane at the same time. Thanks, Andy. Of course, it's not just in the cockpit. The rest of the airplane is also kitted out with test equipment, and we're going to take a look back there. We have several systems that help us be safe. One of them is this egress system. So we do high-risk testing. We'll actually wear parachutes and helmets and oxygen masks like you see in a military fighter. And we have ways of getting out of the airplane. And on this airplane, we have a, a set of doors here to open up. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then a fireman's pole. We use. And now all we have to do is throw this handle and we can slide our way out if we need to. There's also one in the back of the airplane that's similar, but it opens sideways and we can get out that way. A lot of the orange equipment you'll notice in here, this is experimental equipment, things that haven't been certified before. For instance, our egress pallet here, that crash axe or all our oxygen equipment to fight fires. These boxes here are ballast boxes. We fill them with bricks or bags uh, of lead shot yeah. to alter the center of gravity before we leave. And then the system behind you, there's one of these in the forward and in the aft part of the airplane that's full of water. We pump water back and forth to control the center of gravity for different kinds of testing. We'll work our way back. On this airplane, we have three in three racks that people can sit at. So this first rack is the vendor rack. In this phase of the program, we're set up for avionics. And so we'll have Rockwell Collins engineers here working with the cockpit and, and tweaking gains and things like that in the autopilot. So this is the home of the FTE, or the flight test engineer. And here's where all the logs are taken, the hand notes. The flight test engineer on board has access to all the data. We have certain screens made up that we can analyze real time and make sure everything's going safely and that we're doing things efficiently and effectively. So this is where you work? This is exactly where I sit. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We've seen how Bombardier build an aircraft, we've seen how they test an aircraft. But now we're going to fly in one, the Learjet 60 XR, to Montreal. Where's Dave? I hope he hasn't got me out though. All the brochures say it, but the Learjet 60 XR certainly does have ramp presence. It can seat up to nine passengers, travel 2,338 nautical miles at a maximum speed of 0.81 Mach and up to an altitude of 51,000 feet. Bombardier also claimed that the 60XR has the fastest climb rate of any jet in its class, which Learjet demo pilot Rick Rowe kindly showed us with a performance takeoff on our way to Montreal. Obviously we didn't leave without DC. Now we're in a Learjet 60XR that's been fully custom spec. You can have several different variations. You can have a bar, a flat screen TV, even a food warm-up. There's also several different seating plans you can have. This one's got the uh, divan. 
But although I prefer being back here, let's see what it's like up in the office. Cheers. The 60XR is the last of the legacy Learjets. The newer uh, Learjets, the Learjet 45 and the soon to be introduced Learjet 85 are new generation airplanes and they're taking advantage of a lot of technology and design but still maintaining that Learjet look and the performance of Learjets. It's very responsive, uh, the control harmony is very nice, it's a well balanced airplane, it's a well mannered airplane, uh, it's very good for pilots to fly and it's a very comfortable airplane for passengers to ride in. Well, that was pretty good, pretty quick. Oh, it's all right. But well, what we need is something bigger. Much bigger. For the band. For the band. Well, that's fantastic news. It looks like there's going to be a Loop Show band. They didn't tell me anything about it, but I'm sure they got a really top spot in line for me. Maybe even the drummer. Anyway, thanks to Bombardier for all their help in putting together this special report on their jets, which are seriously sexy bits of kit. The Lear are like the sports cars, and the guys next time around look at the uh, slightly more impressive and expensive ones, the Challengers, so tune back for that. And if you want to know about the absolute pinnacle of the range, well, you've got a test in the Global 5000, the next edition of P1. So that's it from little old me this month. Next month, of course, I'll be joined back in the studio by ladies' favourites, Dave Rawlings and Dave Calderwood. So until then, enjoy yourself. See you in a month.